a killer with a firearm attacked Michigan State University, murdering three and wounding five others. The shootings at Michigan State University left three students dead and five others critically injured. Brian Frazier, a sophomore, and Alexandria Verner, a junior, were among those killed. The gunman, 43-year-old Anthony McRae, first opened fire on the campus Monday, just before 8.30 p.m. Oh, my God. There's still people down there trying to get out. Shooting at two locations, the first inside a classroom at Berkey Hall. While the officers were managing that scene at Berkey Hall, we began receiving additional reports of another shooting at the MSU Union Building. I'm coming down stairwell 13 with seven people. One witness to the shooting says his fight or flight response kicked in. So I booked it to the far side of the class and ducked down and he came in and shot three to four times in our, uh, our classroom. Police released a photo of the shooter taken from campus security cameras, and a caller's tip sent them to Lansing, Michigan. It's gonna be a suspect wearing red shoes in the backpack. The search ended just before midnight. Just where? Clear, shots fired 2349. Subject down. Police say McCray shot himself during a confrontation and died. 43 year old Anthony McCray, a black man, had a history of mental health issues and was charged with multiple gun-related crimes in 2019. But a George Soros-backed prosecutor, Carol Seaman, let McRae plead to a lesser misdemeanor charge and dismiss the felony charge, a charge that would have barred him from owning a firearm. Seaman made it her office's official policy in August 2021 to drop mandatory prison sentences for felony firearms charges, claiming the sentencing enhancement led to dramatic racial inequity, close quote. That's why I mentioned his race. She's one of several Soros-backed or George Soros-linked or so-called reform prosecutors, including Philadelphia's Larry Krasner, Chicago's Kim Fox, LA's George Gascon, and San Francisco's Chesa Bodine, all of whose cities have seen an increase in crime. And after the Michigan State shooting, Michael Bloomberg's publication called The Trace blame my guest for the shooting at MSU. Check out this tweet. After a mass shooting, said the tweet, people often ask why the U.S. hasn't passed stronger gun laws. One major factor, John Lott, a researcher whose work has been used for decades to justify looser firearm regulations, despite serious concerns about his methods. Please welcome John Lott of the Crime Prevention Research Center, CrimeResearch.org. Goodness, John, it's all your fault. Well, I guess a lot of people already suspected that, but after mass public shootings for the last few months, at least, uh, Michael Bloomberg's groups uh, go to Twitter and other social media and claim that I'm somehow responsible for these attacks. Uh, just last week, I was in Maryland testifying and I had Moms Demand Action people screaming in my face that I was responsible for children's deaths around the country. So, but look, uh, you're exactly right about what happened in this case. I mean, here we had an individual who should have easily been convicted of a felony that would have been five years in prison. Uh, instead, the charges were dropped. Uh, if he had been convicted, he'd still be in jail, very likely at this point. Um, but he also would have been barred from legally buying guns. Instead, what do we see? The gun control groups and gun control politicians make no mention of what you're talking about. Instead, they talk about having things like uh, expanded universal background checks or something like that, which would have been completely irrelevant in this case if you don't convict the person and put a felony record on his background to begin with. Uh, I want to do something, but I want to do something that matters. And what you see in case after case with these mass public shootings is that these murderers specifically target places where they know victims aren't going to be able to go and defend themselves. They may be crazy in some sense, but they're not stupid. They want to get media coverage, and they know if they go to a place where victims aren't able to defend themselves, where they're not going to have permanent concealed handguns, uh, they're going to be more successful in killing more people. You know, in this case, <clears throat> you have a situation where, um, uh, well, I'll give you an example. From last year, look at the Buffalo mass murder. He, the media he refuses to talk about what these guys have in their manifestos and diaries in terms of how they plan the attacks that they do. 
uh, the guy last year explicitly talked about an ideal target would be one where there were no permanent concealed handguns allowed. So, but the media will refuse to even mention that. John, what are the alleged serious flaws in your research that uh, the Bloomberg piece is talking about? Well, I mean, I, I suppose there, I don't know what, what particular ones that they're talking about, but they basically what they do is they quote some people saying that my, uh, my work is flawed or whatever. Are there academics, you know, like at the Bloomberg School of Public Health or whatever that dislike my work research? Yeah, sure there are. But there are even more peer-reviewed published studies that find similar results to what I find or even stronger results. Uh, you know, you can look at some issues, like the simple issue about uh, what types of places these mass murderers pick. Um, you have something like the Gun Violence Archive, which is a group that was recently caught lobbying the Centers for Disease Control to remove information on defensive gun uses from their website because they were concerned that it was making it difficult for them to pass the gun control laws that they wanted. What they they say that uh, the type of work that I've done on defensive gun uses are flawed. That they should just look at news stories uh, to go and document the number of defensive gun uses that occur. You know, about only about twenty two percent of violent crimes are reported to police. And the media just reports on a tiny fraction of those. And if you go and you look at the, the defensive gun uses that are reported, most of them involve cases where the attackers kill. About 42% involve instances where the attacker has been wounded. And then you have just 4% where you have simple brandishing was used to stop the attack. We know that about 95% or so of brandishing is what's used to stop attacks. But, you know, what's newsworthy doesn't always reflect reality in some sense. So you go out, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. If you or I were editor of a news bureau someplace and we had two stories that came across our desk, in one case, uh, uh, you have somebody murdered. In another case, let's say a woman brandishes a gun, the criminal runs away, no shots are fired, no crime actually committed. You're not even completely sure what crime would have been committed, which story would you or I pick in terms of the most newsworthiness, the one that would get the most attention? It's very likely the first one, but, but we still care about both cases if we care about policy, if we care about what makes people safe. And the notion that just relying on news reports to go and determine how frequently people use guns defensively or, or how defensive gun uses turn out just seems kind of ridiculous to me. What's that? The great Eldersky? has a pair of my slippers in his baby brown libertarian fingers. He most certainly does. And you can get a pair as well. They come in different colors and they come in different styles. Just call the number on your screen or go to mypillow.com, promo code elder. As you can see, there are over 100 products. This is the one that started it all, the my pillow. They come in different sizes. You've never slept on anything more comfortable. Go to the website, mypillow.com from a cold elder or call the number on your screen. And here is the six pack towels. They're called towels that work, meaning they actually absorb water. Have you noticed that a lot of the towels in the stores, they look good, they feel good, they feel fluffy, but you get them home, you try them, they don't absorb the water. These do, this is a six pack, they come in different colors. And finally, here is the Giza Dream bed sheet. My Pillow Giza Dream Bedsheet, made from cotton from Giza, an area in Egypt where they grow the best cotton in the world, according to Mike Lindell. And he ought to know. So call the number on your screen or go to mypillow.com, promo code elder, mypillow.com, promo code elder. John, in this case, this guy was apparently mentally ill. His own father said so. Uh, his father caught him with a firearm and told the son to get rid of the firearm. The son lied to the dad and kept the firearm. What do we do about people who are mentally ill? What, what about these so-called red flag laws? Do they work? Should they be strengthened? What would you advocate? Well, I think we need to basically use the involuntary commitment type laws. Uh, you know, you go and look at surveys of people and you'll see that uh, if you ask them, uh, should judges be able to temporarily take away a person's guns if they're a danger to themselves or others? 
And by two to one or three to one margins, people support that. That's, in fact, what the involuntary commitment laws are that we have right now. I would maybe change the standard in terms of what you have to show in order to commit somebody. I think we changed those in the 1970s to make it much more difficult for involuntary commitment. But what red flag laws do are, is something different. What they do is a judge based simply on a written complaint can take away a person's guns. There's no mental health care professionals involved. There's no hearing. And uh, people can explain why they may need a gun or what the other issues might be. They're not allowed to confront the person who made the complaint that's there. Um, I, I think that uh, the big problem with red flag laws, though, is the notion that somehow if you simply take away their legally owned gun, you've solved whatever problem might have existed. But 99% of uh, red flag law cases involve suicide. The notion that simply taking away a person's gun when there's so many ways that somebody can go and commit suicide, just doesn't seem like a serious response to me with no mental health uh, help for the individual that's there. The notion that if somebody is a danger to others, you know, you can illegally ob obtain a gun, even if you took away his legally owned gun, the person can use a car to drive through a sidewalk to go and kill people or parade. We see people doing things like that. And, you know, if you're going to be serious about these things, I think you have to do more than just simply think, well, if I just take away a gun, which is what gun control advocates want people to believe, just taking away a gun will solve the problem. Uh, you know, I don't think it's serious. You know, John, I, I have a problem with so-called strengthening red flag laws, if that means lowering the standard uh, under which you can take somebody's firearms. Uh, you know, there's something uh, called the Second Amendment. Even weird people need protection. All right. Well, look, you look at people who are mentally ill, uh, they're much more likely than the average citizen to be a victim of a violent crime. And they also tend to be much less likely to be violent themselves than the average citizen that's out there. Uh, you know, I, I would make a distinction between red flag laws and these other type of involuntary commitment type laws, because the involuntary commitment uh, has a hearing. If you can't afford a lawyer, one is provided for you. You're allowed to go and cross-examine the witnesses that are there. I, th I think that's a huge difference. Um, but, uh, you know, if you're going to change the standards for what you're going to have for people being involuntarily committed, uh, I think that's the only place to do it. I wouldn't do it with red flag laws where a judge is simply going to see a written complaint by somebody and the judge doesn't even talk to the person. Who made the written complaint? Finally, John, you have written for years about the hundreds of thousands of times every single year that Americans use firearms to defend themselves, usually just brandishing it. Um, and I remember you told me some years ago that the LA Times challenged you uh, because uh, they felt that you were overstating the number of times this happened. They gave you two weeks to find uh, instances in which uh, citizens use guns to defend themselves. And you did it without breaking a sweat. And to their credit, they published your research and they admitted that they had undercounted the number of defensive uses of guns. Right. Well, they just didn't even believe there were news stories on it. And so I said, fine, you know, I'll go and show it to you. I argued back and forth with the op-ed editor. He said, fine, you can go and try. And basically that afternoon, I pulled up about a dozen cases from the previous month that was very easy to find those cases. Uh, you know, the amazing thing is uh, we did a, a deep dive on defensive gun use news stories around the country a couple of years ago. And if you look at the five largest newspapers in the United States during uh, uh, 2021, uh, you'll find a total of 10 defensive gun use stories. That's the New York Times, the L.A. Times, the Washington Post. USA Today and the Wall Street Journal, between the five of them, they had a combined total of 10 stories. And most of those had something go wrong. You know, by contrast, they had over 1,700 news stories about somebody being killed or wounded in a criminal uh, attack. They had over 2,700 news stories about gun crimes. So, you know, it's not too surprising that somebody who's an editor at the Los Angeles Times who may rely on, uh, on news stories from the LA Times or the New York Times wouldn't be familiar with all those cases that were there. Um, and the ones that they do have, usually something goes wrong, which is one of the reasons why I think that those are the ones that they publish. 
last thing, John, uh, do you have reason to believe that you have been suppressed on social media, places like Twitter, faces, places like Facebook? Oh, I, I, yeah, I don't think there's much doubt. I mean, on Twitter, for years, uh, the number of followers I had was kind of limited at 27,000. And then uh, when the Twitter board approved uh, Elon Musk's takeover, uh, the number of followers I had increased to about 33,000 uh, or high 32,000. And then uh, when Elon Musk's offer was rescinded, uh, it fell back down uh, to about 28,000. And now it's up to about 38,000. So, you know, as soon as Elon Musk actually took over Twitter, then it started going back up again. So, uh, you know, maybe it's just, you know, random timing. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm sure. I'm sure, John. It was just a coincidence. <laughs> John Lott, Crime Prevention Research Center, CrimeResearch.org. John, as always, thank you very much for coming on. Thank you very much, Larry. Appreciate you being there. You got it. Now I know you like the show, so be sure and hit that like button. Also hit that subscribe button. We want as many subscribers as possible. Get the word out. And scroll down, and you can see where you can join our mailing list to make sure you don't miss any of our vids. Believe it or not, every now and then, YouTube has an issue with some of our videos. So to make sure you get them all, make sure you get on our mailing list. And finally, there's a donate button. Hit the donate button. Throw a little something in the tip jar to make sure we can continue to give you hard-hitting, in-your-face, common sense, truthful programming. Larry with Epoch, E-P-O-C-H dot com. Larry with Epoch dot com. I'm Larry Elder. This has been the Larry Elder Show for Epic Times. Remember, we've got a country to save. I'll see you next time.